Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Filter. On this show, we recognize that the world can be a confusing place to live in. And so what I seek to do on this show is to equip you to live with biblical clarity in our confusing world so that you can face the chaos of life with wisdom, integrity, and courage. Today, I'm excited to welcome Timothy Pickavance to the show. We discussed his new book, Knowledge for the Love of God. We talked about the meaning of faith and why it is not contrary to knowledge. Tim also shows us how knowledge is necessary for the Christian life and for growing in our relationship with God. Timothy Pickavance is Associate Professor and Chair of Philosophy at Talbot School of Theology, Biola University. And he's a scholar in residence at Redeemer Presbyterian Church in Newport Beach, California, where he is also a ruling elder. He is the co-author with Robert C. Coons of both Metaphysics, The Fundamentals, and The Atlas of Reality, A Comprehensive Guide to Metaphysics. Before we get into this conversation, let me encourage you to subscribe to Filter wherever you get your podcasts so that you don't miss out on any of our future episodes. You can also sign up for our email list so that you get a notification in your inbox every time that we release a new episode. Also, if you've been helped by this episode or by any of our other episodes here on Filter, uh, it would greatly help us if you left us a rating and review and shared the show with your friends. Leave Filter a five-star rating on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Also, write a review on Apple Podcasts. Whenever you take these simple steps, it only takes a minute of your time, but it greatly helps us to get the message of biblical clarity out to more people. Well, without any further delay, let's jump into this great conversation that I got to have with Timothy Pickavance. Tim, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me, Aaron. Glad to have you on. It's been fun to get to do a little small talk here and get to know each other a little bit. Mm -hmm. You are a professor and interim dean at Biola University. Tell us a little bit about what you do and how you got to where you are today. Yeah, so I've been teaching at Biola in the philosophy department. We have a master's program in philosophy inside the School of Theology at Biola. And so I've been a faculty member here since 2008 when I finished my PhD at the University of Texas. So before that, I was a student in this very program. So mm. um, I've been connected to Biola and the, the MA philosophy program since 2000, 2000, actually, is when I started here. So I've, I've been around a while and I've uh, been teaching here for a long time now. It's been a great um, place to be. And then this year, I, I've stepped into the role of interim dean. And uh, that's been a new kind of adventure. But I'm still connected to the students in the MA Phil. I'm actually teaching a class on metaphysics right now to our remote students, our students who do the program uh, mm -hmm. through online modalities. So, uh, yeah, I've, I, I love it here. I think it's a great it's a great place. We're celebrating our 30th anniversary uh, of the MA Phil this year, started by Scott Ray and J.P. Moreland 30 years ago. And wow. um, at this point, I think we've sent something like 230 students on to do doctorates in philosophy all over the world. Wow. Um, so it's it's been a joy and a privilege to be a part of this place for as long as I've been able to be here. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And I've long admired the uh, program and uh, faculty, everything that you guys have going on at Biola. Uh, important institution that you guys have there mm -hmm. and important uh, work that you're doing. And so... I really appreciate that, uh, all the work that you guys are doing. Well, um, thanks. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. 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 Believe it or not, we got these students, former students who are going off and starting MA programs themselves and trying to steal our students from us. So, you know, uh, you know, we're, we're like working our way out of our own jobs, I think. So, uh, <laughs> which, I mean, this is, it's actually that in all seriousness though, Aaron, th this has been one of the great things to see is yeah. that the movement that's been going on here for as long as it's been going on is actually now branching off and there are new programs like or similar to anyway the one that we've had here for a long time starting yeah. up in other places attracting other students with different sorts of emphases i mean it's really multiplying at this point and and that is just a joy to watch happen it's been really really fun yeah and that really is great to see because we need more um, serious work in Christian philosophy, apologetics. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it really is great to see that. Yeah. But yeah, we're having you on the show today to talk about your new book that came out called Knowledge for the Love of God. It's a great book. I've been reading it and really enjoying it. And uh, oh, so let's just talk about what, what inspired you to write this book in particular. 
Yeah, I mean, there, there are really two things. The first is, um, you know, I teach mainly philosophy students in the MA program here at Biola, but I also teach undergraduate students and mainly in, in basic theology and integration, which is a Biola sort of distinctive. Hmm. And so for the last four or five years, I've been teaching these big freshman level courses. Uh, one of them in particular is called Foundations of Christian Thought. And in that class, we introduce students to the idea of, of loving God in every domain of life with your mind, with your work, understanding the role of the scriptures and so on. So, it, and, and what I've seen is that those students are coming even to a place like Biola, right? And Biola is the kind of place you come when you really care about this stuff. Mm -hmm. Even these students are struggling to piece together why it is that God calls us to love him with not just our emotions and our will, but also with our mind. And of course, that's not a new problem, but it's just something that I've been encountering in a new and fresh way. And I, I over the course of teaching that class as much as I have, I thought that I'd developed some helpful ways to talk about some of these things. Yeah. And so I thought, uh, maybe I should write this down in a book. And, and so I did. And uh, it, it's now a thing. But but more personally, with respect to me, I really dealt with a period between the time that I finished my MA here at Talbot and came back to teach a kind of crisis that had Lots of different elements, but some of them at least were about the role of knowledge in the Christian life. And, and part of what happened was that I was doing this doctoral work, doing high-level work in philosophy at a really sort of high-power doctoral program. And I came to a position where I was struggling to figure out why in the world would I continue to do these sorts of things in philosophy that weren't so obviously connected to showing people who Jesus was who didn't know him at all, right? So mm. I got into philosophy because I thought philosophy could help bring people into the church, right? That is, it has a kind of apologetic upshot, even, and I'm also just kind of interested in it. But what I'm trying to describe is a period where I was really wrestling with why should I get up in the morning and do this work that doesn't seem so connected to that aim, and what I came to realize was that the life of the mind wasn't just about getting you into the door of the church. It was actually about your devotion to Jesus. And so the, the, the pursuit of God with your mind is important for your devotion to Jesus. And that was a revolutionary sort of recognition or, or sort of realization for me, even as someone who had been committed to the life of the mind on behalf of Jesus's church for a number of years. And so I thought that there was a little bit of a gap in some of the conversation around loving God with your mind. And I thought I could help maybe fill it a little bit in a way mm -hmm. that would also help um, the students that I have. And then eventually my own children, believe it or not. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's kind of what motivated me writing the book. Yeah. 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 That's great. And you start the book by talking about that personal journey that you went through mm -hmm. and Ex introducing the readers to what is your core task, which is arguing for the necessity of knowledge in the Christian life. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think, like you mentioned it before, there being a gap there in that conversation. This is something that I've read about in different times and um, a conversation that I'm familiar with. And so whenever I started reading your book, I thought I knew what you were talking about, like what your aim was. <laughs> but then I realized uh, where that gap was. Like you just mentioned, whenever I started yeah. reading and realizing, oh, no, he's doing something that is unique here. Because what you're doing is you're arguing for the nece necessity of knowledge in the Christian life. Uh, basically, if I remember right, what you say in the introduction is we all understand that knowledge is important for coming to know Jesus, mm -hmm. know what he did for us, and then how to become a Christian, how to be saved. But then after that, yep. is knowledge necessary? Yep. So this is what you're trying to do in the book. So. What I just introduced there, explain what you mean by that, and then you know we can go into the argument that you make for why knowledge is essential, not just for becoming a Christian, but for the whole Christian life. Yeah, I mean, I think what I realized was that when Jesus would say things like, you know, and, and really this is, this is pervasive throughout the whole of Scriptures, but when Jesus is referencing, you know, the Old Testament and saying, 
you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. The bit about loving God with your mind is when you just kind of consider that afresh with like fresh eyes, it's pretty clear. He's not saying like, love God with your mind until you get inside the church. And then you can kind of stop. Like you don't have to worry about it anymore. You have everything that you've, you've got it all figured out at that point. Right. And that's not what he's saying. He's seen, he's saying that your devotion to God is connected to the pursuit of God with your mind. Right. Mm. And there, the, the role of knowledge in the Christian life is all over the pages of the New Testament, but it's not something that we spend a lot of time talking about. And it's not entirely clear what that knowledge is supposed to do in your pursuit of Jesus. But what I came to kind of realize is that there are sort of obvious ways that this is important. Or anyway, it's obvious that it's important. Let me give you an example. Yeah. So I love my wife. Uh, we're celebrating our 20th anniversary this coming summer. It's very exciting. We're, mm-hmm. we're very old now, and we get to tell young married people what to do. It's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> but so I love my wife, and it's pretty obvious to me that that love involves things like my affection for her, so what I feel when I think about her. But it's equally obvious that it involves understanding her, knowing her, cognitively because if someone were to say oh oh you think you know your wife really well you think you love her well well you know um when's her birthday and i was like i don't know or you know what color are her eyes no idea and if you asked me like what does she and that's just like trivial things right but if you started Mm -hmm. to ask me things like what does she want what does she hope for what does she fear what what is she seeking what sorts of things does she feel like she's missing what sorts of things does she celebrate what makes her happy? What makes her sad? If you started to ask me those kinds of things and I had no idea what the answers to those things were, you would think I was crazy for claiming that my I had devotion to my wife. Yeah. That would be nuts because obviously when you love someone, you pursue them to understand them. Not whole, That's not the whole story, right? That's not the only thing that we're doing, obviously. There's more to it than that but there's not less. And so I think the thing that I've started to notice is that once people get acquainted with God on the front end, they think, well, okay, now I have everything that I I know everything I need to know about God. And I just think we don't apply that standard to any other human relationship. We get into even marriages where we still have a lot to learn, a lot of ways to grow together And that involves deeper and fuller understanding of the person you love. And so that's the that's the big thing that I think is going on. That's why knowledge matters to the Christian life, because the Christian life is fundamentally about devotion to God, loving God well, and then loving your neighbors. And that requires understanding God, who he is, what he's doing, what he cares about, all that other stuff that you want to understand about your spouse, say. Yeah, yeah, no, that's so good. Now, what if someone said, okay, I understand, and you know what, I, I even agree with you, but I... I feel like I can know God through my feelings. I feel like I can know God through my experiences. Mm -hmm. So what are you trying to add to that? What would you say to someone who sort of pushes back with uh, this? I, this, because I know where, I know where where you're getting at. Yeah. That we, that we find the knowledge of God in Mm -hmm. in scripture and so on. Yeah. But someone who, who sort of pushes back against having that objective revelation. Mm hmm. So I think that those sorts of things, the the sort of first personal experience, and it's it's really even beyond that. It's actually what people like Eleanor Stump would call second personal experience. So it's it's experiencing a person where there's a mutual recognition of the other's personhood, right? So that kind of experience is extraordinarily important in the Christian life. I even think, and in fact, my academic work these days is about the role of things like emotions and other affective states in the 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 life of the mind and also in our lives more generally so i think emotions and feelings and those kinds of of experiences are are vitally important and we cannot we cannot ignore those so i want to affirm the instinct of this person which is to say you can know god through those kinds of things i agree with that 100 percent. but 
that does not stand in any kind of competition with the idea that I'm trying to uh, sort of defend uh, or, or sort of put forward and, and champion, which is that understanding the things that we do with our mind to grasp on to reality, to grasp on to truth, those things are equally important. We can't have one without the other in a life of devotion in the same way. Again, just going back to my experience with my wife or with my children, you know, it's any real relationship where there's love involved. There's both cognitive understanding and there's the cultivation of experience and feeling and, and emotion and affect and will and all the other parts of the heart. So one of the things that I kind of go on about is that biblically speaking, the mind is not distinct from the heart, which is something that we often in our culture, we pit mm. the mind and the heart over against one another. But biblically, and this, this runs through the Hebrew, and it, it's also true in, in Greek New Testament, that the heart encompasses the mind. It's more than a mind, but it's not less, right? And so in the, in the case of why do we need to attend to our minds, it's because our minds are part of our heart. And we want to love God with our whole selves, right? That's what the heart is representing. We want to love God with our whole self. And that includes our mind. It's not some cold, unrelated thing. Because, again, if you want to love God well, you need to know what God cares about. And you need to know what God wants and, and what he doesn't want and what he worries about for you and all those other things, right? Mm -hmm. So those kinds of understanding are relevant to the rest of your life. And in fact, so one more thing, I know I'm, I'm sort of talking too long about this, but this yeah. is, I think this is actually really important. Yes, yeah, again. One of the ways to come to love something is to learn about it. And I think we all experience this, right? So often when people are bored with something, it's because they really don't get it, right? I have this conversation with people about soccer all the time. So I love, I love soccer. I'm a Tottenham Hotspur fan, which is a tragic thing to be if you know anything about the English Premier League, but I am. And some people are like, this is boring. People say this about baseball too. Baseball is boring. Well, actually, if you kind of come to understand, like to know what's going on between a pitcher and a catcher and a pitcher and a batter and what's happening in the field when people are adjusting and adapting to different people. Like there's a lot happening. Same with soccer. The tactics are actually a really interesting thing. So there's not a lot of scoring. And in that sense, it's not that it's, it's boring in the sense there's not people putting the ball in the back of the net a lot. But if you come to actually understand, you start to see things you didn't see and you actually find that the thing is interesting in itself. And this is a this is a normal experience. People have this experience all the time when they get to university. They didn't think from the outside looking in, chemistry looks really boring. But once you start to get into the weeds, oh, man, there's a lot of really interesting stuff going on here. So knowing actually cultivates certain kinds of feelings. And that goes the other way, too. Like when you when you have affection for something, you move toward it, naturally mm -hmm. speaking. Yeah. So I think our minds are one way that God helps us to draw near to him in even our feelings. So I, I just want to add that piece because I think that's so vital. If you ever don't like someone, try to learn something about them. And I bet you'll come to know the, or you'll come to like them a little bit more. Mm, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's good. And so true. You know, um, so as we were talking before, my full-time job is I'm the pastor of a church, uh, a mm -hmm. church that we planted uh, several years ago. And, you know, just seeing people's spiritual journey, and uh, seeing people come to faith and that experience after conversion. One of the primary marks that you see in someone who truly has come to know God or uh, has really experienced a renewal in their relationship with God is that they are just hungry for knowing him. Mm -hmm. And they're uh, asking questions about the Bible because they're reading the Bible so much more, asking for book recommendations or wanting to talk about books and so on because they are just so hungry for mm -hmm. God. And I think what, something you said a minute ago is so important. This, um, how, you know, as modern people, we divide between these two things mm -hmm. inside was called like the mind and the heart, which like can be helpful to talk about, uh, as distinct things. But yeah, in, in the classical thought, Hebrew thought, they didn't make that clear distinction. Mm -hmm. And so whenever our heart, is hungry for God. In other words, whenever we're hungry for an experience of God, we can't leave out the mind. 
Yeah. But conversely, we also can't, if we're hungry for him with our mind and we're filling up with knowledge of him, we can't leave out the affections either. We can't leave out that um, experience uh, in our heart, like, like as we said before. We can't leave that out either. And I think that there might be some listeners who are listening to this and they're thinking, you know, here we go, another couple of uh, heady guys talking about how we need to read more books yeah. and blah, blah, blah. Uh -huh. And, you know, they say, but, but, but we're, you know, the, the people who follow our advice end up becoming dry oh, yeah. and they end up uh, using their, all their book reading as uh, an, an avoidance of actually opening their affections to God. And mm -hmm. I think that is a legitimate pushback, mm -hmm. right? And concern. So as you argue for the necessity of knowledge, how mm -hmm. do you also balance in with it, you know, towards the kind of guys who might tend to be like me and you, wow. who do live a little too much in our heads sometimes? How do you kind of balance out that conversation for those who are super excited about the knowledge part, but not as much about the experience? Yeah, I, I think that that is a that is such an important question. And as someone um, who has experienced <laughs> that kind of problem, I, I think it's I think it's important to reflect on that. Now, I, one thing that I, I want to point out is that our understanding, our cognitive understanding, our knowledge, propositional knowledge, as I call it, knowledge that certain things are true, needs to be understood as having a purpose relevant to drawing us near to God. So we should not. So that's the, the first stage is just recognizing what knowledge is for. And this is why the, <laughs> the book is called Knowledge for the love of God, right? Mm -hmm. It's supposed to draw you into the love of God, which involves the mind, but more than the mind, right? So that's the first stage is that just base recognition, okay? So after that, the next stage is that you have to understand how to organize your thought life. You have to, as, the, as Paul would put it, take thoughts captive, and I think that part of, at least part of what he means there, is that we need to organize our thinking around the basic storyline of the scriptures, the basic storyline of Christianity, which is that God is creator, he made this world good, we have fallen, and the whole world has experienced the consequences of that. God has been from the fall's beginning reaching out to redeem the world. And in the end, that redemption will be consummated as heaven comes to earth and the earth is made new again. So that basic story. And the thing that I love about thinking in terms of that story and using our understanding as ways of, of sort of filling in that story and putting flesh on it. The reason why I think that's so helpful is because everybody knows that a story is not just a plot line. A story brings with it hopes and expectations and longings and fears and all the other aspects of the heart in very natural ways. So hmm. here's an example. Um, I love Harry Potter. So I think Harry Potter stories are fantastic. I think they're great. I love fantasy literature kind of generally. Um, so, you know, I love the Lord of the Rings. I know, you know, Gandalf's other names and so on. So, you know, like all that kind of stuff, right? It's great. But if you're reading the Harry Potter stories and you find yourself like hoping that Voldemort wins in the end, it's not just that you've like, you're messed up somehow, though you might be. It's actually that you're not understanding the story. Part of understanding the story is conforming yourself, giving yourself to the other aspects of the heart that are relevant to the story. When you really put yourself inside that storyline, you start to feel the things that you're meant to feel. And that's a sign of a good storyteller, right? Is you have the experiences as if you're in the world. And that, that's, that's one of the things that makes storytelling so beautiful. It can help you figure out what other people are thinking and feeling and so on, et cetera, right? So the reason I'm talking about stories is because part of loving God with your mind is 
taking all the things that you're learning about God and about the world he's made and about yourself and situating them within the great storyline of the scriptures. And that will naturally begin to connect your mind and your heart together because that's what stories do. That's why stories are so powerful. That's why God communicates to us so much in stories. So I I, I guess like what I want to say is, yes, we need to attend to all those things, but if we do that attending in the right ways, if we take all thoughts captive, there will be a natural inclination to embrace the other aspects of the Christian life as well. And then they start to mutually reinforce one another because your feelings and your experiences and your affect begin to align with what you understand. And then your understanding, in my view, is actually aided by those things. And then you get in this kind of like positive spiral, as it were, where Mm -hmm. there's a feedback mechanism that allows you to move into deeper and deeper knowledge of God. And that is a beautiful thing that we want to celebrate. Yeah, that's so good. And it reminds me that, you know, there's whenever we, because I was thinking, you know, what does it mean to have knowledge of God or Mm -hmm. knowledge about God? And it, it means that we hold certain propositions about him, mm-hmm. right, and uh, of his attributes and character and so on. But it also means the knowledge that we gain from the stories about God and the stories mm-hmm. where God has revealed himself and, and then what propositions we can take away from that as well. So one of the things that just you know makes the Bible such a rich, rich mm-hmm. read for us if we really um, – look at it closely and appreciate it for all of its nuance and the diversities of storytelling and literature yeah. types. And, you know, yeah, we, I, we, I, we learn about God through letters from Paul. We yeah. learn about him through stories, through poetry. Uh, it's beautiful. I think one of the amazing things about the Bible is if you, if you start to attend to the scriptures stories, understanding that like, God might might maybe just be a really good storyteller that he's like literarily <laughs> good, <laughs> like he's a good writer. Mm. Uh, it turns out that the stories are extraordinary, but it extends even beyond that, Aaron. So I just want to add one more thing here, yeah. which is I think that even in like science classrooms here at Biola, we need to be attending to what we're learning there as ways of understanding even the mind of God. So when you think about it, natural laws are just patterns that we see in the world about the way things interact with one another. Mm -hmm. Well, if God really is the creator and sustainer of the world, if all things were made by, through, and for Christ, right, the logos of God, if that's what's actually going on in creation, then when you're learning about the laws of chemistry or biology or physics, you're actually studying the mind of God. Now, that's an incredible thing. And yeah. what that does is it draws attention to the, the, the radical intelligence of this creator that we have, the amazing creativity, and all those other things. Not in a way that stand, it's not like this is tacked on. Just by understanding the very nature of what these laws are, you're led into a posture of, of worship, because you're seeing this God as someone who is able to hold all of this together, the, the things that we, we, we're we taking generations to even scratch the surface mm. on the laws of physics. <laughs> mm. like, but, but God made all this stuff, and he holds it all together by the word of his power. I mean, so when you're doing your work in the chemistry lab, you're coming to understand the logos of God, which is just... The incarnate Christ, right? I mean, that's like, what a gift, you know? Yeah. And and that kind of approach to these things, that way of situating your understanding of the world within the broad storyline of the scriptures, because what that's doing is it's amplifying the creation part, right? That will just naturally draw you into the person of God to encounter him face to face, as it were. It won't be some dry you know, thing that you're doing because yeah. your bio prof told you you had to. <laughs> yeah, that's so good. And what you touched on is really the heart behind the this whole show and why it exists is to look at all of life, whether it's mm. theology and philosophy or history uh, or whatever else, you know, the sciences and to see God's work in all of life and mm. to see see his fingerprints 
in all of life to understand all of life through uh through god's work and so that's yeah great. you know one of the conversations that's had often in philosophy of religion is the relationship between knowledge and faith mm. and are these two things compatible or mm. does the christian or the person who lives by faith have to give up knowledge leave it at the mm. front door mm. uh what's your response to that conversation and how do you address it in the book yeah so the the main thing i think to know about and this is such an important question Aaron. i like i'm glad you're asking that question um the main thing about the scriptures conversation about faith is that they they just it never is a contrast with knowing now it's a contrast with certain ways of knowing and those ways of knowing are ways of knowing that our culture elevates be above the others and here's what i mean the central contrast in the scripture is between faith and sight hmm. so that, that that is the central contrast around faith is between faith and sight now our contemporary sort of especially in the west but i think this is something the west has exported to other places too um we 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 overvalue seeing as a way of knowing and i actually think that the way we operate sort of betrays that we really don't believe that really deep down but it's the kind of thing that we hear a lot that if you that seeing is believed you know so like sight and the methods that sort of surround that bigger kind of like image which are the empirical methods of observation and inference and you know those kinds of things on the basis of experience like five senses experience those are the things that you, you know in some ways stand in contrast with faith because what the scriptures say is that faith is a way of knowing things that are unseen hmm. and you you see this all over the place it's in paul's letters to the corinthians it's in hebrews and and i mean just think about hebrews 11 and 12 right that sort of hall of faith conversation mm -hmm. a big part of that is that these biblical heroes embrace god's promises the reality of god's promises in the in the words of the author of hebrews from a distance and what he what the author of hebrews is saying is they didn't see them face to face they saw them from far off and that's actually an, an interesting thing to notice too so though the scriptures contrast faith and sight that contrast is played on by the authors of scripture because what they see is that they see with eyes of faith things that are unseen Right. Mm -hmm. So literal sight can't get you there, but the eyes of faith actually can see these things. And I mean, this is like a, a profoundly important thing, and I could go on and on about it. So for, I, I won't. I mean, if you want to see one application of this, I did a chapel here at Biola last semester. And you can go on Biola's YouTube channel and look at that. And I talk about Proverbs 1 and the way this. Anyway, whatever. Now, why am I talking about all this? I'm saying all this because faith contrasts with literal sight but it never contrasts with knowledge in the bible and in fact what the authors of scripture say is that our faith in christ allows us to know things that would otherwise be unknowable this is what the the sort of ancient church would call faith seeking understanding hmm. so you have the eyes of faith and that actually opens to you parts of reality that would otherwise be not open to you in hebrews it's the creation of the world for example it's the deep future it's the nature of christ it's the nature of sin and so on and it's connection to god's god's nature and all those other things that are articles of faith as it were because they're things that are unknowable without the eyes of faith mm. and so what we see is not that faith and knowledge conflict in fact it goes the other way faith allows us to know things that we otherwise wouldn't know because it postures us toward the world in a way of trust that opens us to the word of god so i just think from the point of view of the bible as it were that's a mistake now second thing it's a mistake just from like ordinary notions of faith hmm. <laughs> here's what i mean we express faith in things all the time like we sit down in chairs constantly and 
that's a that's an act of of faith in a way like you, before you sit in it you don't know like you don't you haven't seen the chair hold you up right you you don't you i i actually think you do know it's going to hold you up but you haven't seen it do that you haven't accessed it in an empirical way mm-hmm. it's it's you know you it's an unseen reality it's holding you up until you do it right but your faith in the chair is perfectly compatible with knowing about the chair, understanding the chair, even I think knowing that it'll hold you up. In fact, I think your faith is buttressed by this kind of understanding. Like if you're if you're not just some like, you know, know nothing about the laws of physics and about the way, you know, chairs are made, like if you actually understand wood and how much pressure you can put on it before it collapses and all this other stuff and you made this chair. Like I actually think your knowledge of that thing amplifies your capacity to have faith that it'll do its job. Yeah. And this is true with people. Like the more we understand about a person who is faithful and trustworthy, the more we have faith for them to follow through on their word. This is the same with God, right? So I I actually think that the other kinds of faith, like when you're talking about non-religious faith, it's really just kind of like crazy almost to say that knowledge and that kind of faith are incompatible. Yeah. Like that, that's, that's, that it doesn't make any sense. And yeah. here's it here's it, like the final nail in the coffin for this view in my in my experience is that in fact sometimes it's irrational to lack faith because you know things. Hmm. So like if you know a person really well and you know that they're trustworthy and you know that they follow through on their word and that they keep their promises and all that kind of stuff and you lack faith in them that we, we send people to therapy for that kind of thing, hmm. right? Their heart is not connected to their mind in the right way. So the lack of faith that they have is the irrational thing. It's standing against their knowledge, and that's the problem. <laughs> hmm. So I think not only is it unbiblical, it actually just doesn't make any sense. Like when you think about faith just kind of in normal life. Yeah. So faith and knowledge are mutually reinforcing realities. Yeah, that's so sorry, good. I got really excited there. Aaron. No, that's, that's so good. And <laughs> yeah, I feel you just you nailed exactly. You're, you you've articulated exactly what I felt every time I've read these, whether it's a scholarly oh, article yeah. or just someone sounding off on a YouTube comment about <laughs> how Christians cannot be people uh, of knowledge as well. Mm-hmm. You know because. Because faith and knowledge just don't go together. And yeah, and yeah I just want to say, you, you obviously do not understand at all what the Bible is talking about when it talks about faith in God. Uh, yeah. And you, you you don't know what faith means at all. You know, it's obviously based upon this bad assumption that, that faith is uh, an intentional taking of a position with no knowledge or reasons at all. And, like, yeah. that's the essence of what faith is, that's a position yeah. taken without any basis at all. And it's just so far from the truth. You know, I think, been... Aaron, if we get away from thinking about religious faith, that point becomes almost inescapable. I mean, if you if you situate the conversation around faith in ordinary things, in mm-hmm. ordinary people, yeah, it helps you break out of that in a way that I think is really useful. Yeah, it does. Um, yeah. So sorry to interrupt you, but that yeah. that I think that that movement. It, you you can only maintain that if you if you're sort of like organizing only around religious faith because it feels a little spooky somehow, mm-hmm. but it's really not. It's I mean it's a it's faith in a person who actually exists, right? In our case, and yeah. if that's right, then it's it should have some similar structure. It's not exactly the same, but it's going to be similar in structure to the kinds of faith we have in, uh, you know, our friends. Yeah. And and that you know once you see that it starts you start to say oh wait a minute faith and knowledge look like they actually are mutually reinforcing not in contrast or conflict with one another yeah not at all and just you know, in my own personal experience the times that I've gone through whether it's just a spiritually dry period or a time of mm-hmm. depression or whatever else and I my faith starts to struggle and it feels mm-hmm. shaken by something any time that I've started to question or you know, if I'm just in a, in a really bad spot, what always brings me back near to God is what I've learned about him. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's the years of growing in knowledge through <sighs> reading books, through reading the scriptures, through, yeah. um, you know, reading philosophy and apologetics. And, <clears throat> and over and over again, I've come to this place where 
Uh, I feel like the disciples in John six, whenever um, all the crowds leave Jesus after he told him that, you know, unless they eat his flesh and drink his blood, they wouldn't be able to enter the kingdom. All the crowds leave and he's left with the 12 and they say, and he, he says, well, what about you guys? And they say, where else can we go? Yeah. You know, like we're, we're with you. We've gone through this yeah. far. We, we cannot go anywhere else now. And that's how I felt, you know, my, mm. the knowledge that I have on the evidences for the resurrection, the classical arguments for God's existence, just, just all these things stacked on top of one another. Mm -hmm. Whenever my faith is shaken, I, I feel just like I'm in the disciple spot where I say, I've got all this, where else can I go? Yeah. You know, it, it pulls me back and it refreshes and restores that faith, uh, along with the Holy spirit, of course. Yeah. One thing that I, I'm thinking about that I want to get your, your thoughts on is what do you think about, uh, sin's effect on mm. knowledge? Does it, can it, uh, hinder knowledge being able to bring us to God and even from being able to grasp some and comprehend some knowledge about God? Oh gosh, that, uh, that's a really big question. And, <laughs> and I, <laughs> I think, um, you know, the, the easy answer is yes, but I take it that you'd like me to say a bit more than that. <laughs> Just so, a bit. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, look, I think that there is a connection between the renewal of our minds and our formation into Christ likeness. I think this is the one of the burdens of Paul's letter to the Romans. And that's actually laid in the letter to the Romans, right? So that comes in Romans 12. And what you see in Romans 1 is the opposite of that. Right? You see that the deformation of our of our of our hearts includes sin and also sort of cognitive distance from God, right? So these things are connected together. They're connected in some obvious ways. For example, if you come to believe that something is good when it's actually evil, then, you know, you're going to be led to do things that are bad, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Because you, you've just got a mistake, right? And, and we see, you know, this is a, a mistake that children make all the time. They think, they think a thing is good, but they're just wrong, right? And so that's part of, you know, instructing them. Now, there are ways that we can solidify in that, and sin does that, because I don't think that there is some gulf between our mind and our will and emotions and so on. I don't think that uh, these days we tend to think, and there, there's like a long history of this that, uh, you know, I'm not an expert in, but I have the vague outlines of, according to which there's the mind on the one hand, and there's your will on the other, and that includes things like your emotions. Mm -hmm. And these two things don't really communicate with one another, right? Yeah. That's actually not, I don't think, the Christian view of things. I think the Christian view uh, is such that your mind and your, your will are actually mutually enforce, reinforcing toward one another, and that can be positive or negative. Hmm. So if you're practicing sin, you're practicing engaging things really in a way that expresses a kind of love for them. Mm -hmm. And that love draws you nearer to them, which draws you further away from God. If you're loving the wrong things or loving in the wrong ways, then, you know, you, 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 that's going to that's gonna impact your mind because you're being drawn to sort of view those things in a light that is inappropriate, right? You're, you're loving something that shouldn't be loved or you're, loving something in a way that you shouldn't love it. And, you know, human beings, we don't like dissonance. And so we tend to align our minds and our wills, you know, over the course of time, right? That's why the ancients would talk about character. And character, the, the, the word, the Greek word that we translate things like character, that actually is evocative of a kind of etching into stone or metal or something, right? And the idea is that character builds grooves, and those grooves are grooves of thought and also action, will, right? So I think that sin can draw you away from God just like worship draws you in, mm. right? So yeah. they're, 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 it's kind of like um, it's, it's a two-way street. You can go either way. But um, there's one way that'd be better to go, 
Um, and that's, you know, the way that is leading you into formation. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, it's so good. So good. I think it answers it well. And of course, this is, that was a really big question to ask. And there's a much, much deeper conversation that's been had on this, you know, for yeah. centuries now, um, yeah. you know, theologians going all the way back through the Reformation and, mm -hmm. and further back have been wrestling with, uh, they call it the noetic effects of sin yeah. and how sin affects our minds and uh, mm -hmm. knowledge and so on. So, but no, but that was a great answer for, for this. Yeah. Podcast. I mean, Romans <laughs> talks about it in terms of suppressing the truth. Yeah. Right. I, yeah. In unrighteous. I, and I, that's totally a thing. Right. I mean, I, and it's not, it's not like I can, I'm saying that as someone who doesn't do that. I mean, we all do this to some degree or other. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's a very, it's, yeah, it's definitely a thing. And yeah. I think when we're all honest, like in the, like in the quiet moments, when we're really honest with ourselves, like we, we can see the ways that we're good at rationalizing away our bad behavior. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, Ooh, well, what do we do the... about that, Aaron? You're a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, no, I'm just, I'm thinking of, uh, Hebrews chapter four, whenever, you know, the author says that the word of God is living and active, sharpening the two-edged sword, piercing down to where nothing else can divide. And that's why we need to be in God's word because we can be, because we can trick ourselves and be deceived and rationalize things. But yeah. Um, but the word of God is able to pierce through and divide and discern between those rationalizations. So there you go. There's my pastoral piece. Yeah, uh, some people might use that as a reason not to read the Bible, Aaron, but I don't think that's what that's you're often, trying to say. That is often why we do. Look, I'll give you another <laughs> bit of pastoral experience. I have never, let me, let me, well, let me be careful and think. Yeah. I have never counseled someone who's been going through a time of doubt, um, or, some kind of spiritual dryness, struggle, whatever else. And while talking to that person also learned that they have been having a disciplined daily time in God's word and prayer. Mm -hmm. Never happened. You know, it's always, uh, you know, some, a, a sin that they've either committed or has been done to them. You know, sometimes it's, it's more yeah. complicated than just someone yeah. avoiding God. Um, totally. but always, yeah, sin, in their heart or once again, being done to them has separated them from God's word. So, mm. uh, yeah. And that necessary knowledge that we need in the book throughout all the chapters you wrote, you go through a lot of different questions related to this mm -hmm. conversation around knowledge and loving God. Uh, and so I'm sure there's a lot of our listeners who have all these questions popping up in their head from this conversation. And, you know, to me, that's one of the marks of like a really good conversation or a really good uh, like session at a conference. It's not just the ones that give you like a good answer, but the one that uh, make you come up with seven more questions. Mm -hmm. the, those are my favorites. And that's what this conversation was like. And so lucky for you guys, if you have all those questions, he most likely answers them in the book. Uh, we're not going to go through them one by one right now. So you're gonna have to pick up the book to get that. But before we go, just one last like kind of to wrap it up, what do you hope that readers of the book or listeners to this episode take away? I, I just I really want people to to see that devotion to God with your mind matters to your actual sort of relationship to God, that your relationship will be amplified and supported and solidified and deepened by pursuing God with your mind. Now, not everybody has to be an academic, right? Like I, I have the luxury of getting to spend a lot of my time thinking and you know, puzzling over ideas. And I know that that's not everybody's experience, right? But we all need to be pursuing God with our minds because, because it's so vital to our devotion. So if you want to love God better, more deeply, more fully, more comprehensively, more whole self-wise, you need to be pursuing understanding who God is and what he does in the sort of pieces that make sense for you, right? And that's going to be different for someone who's a plumber than it is for someone who is, a, you know, Christian philosopher, right? Mm -hmm. But it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's the same for everybody, right? And we all have our, our role to play in building up the mind of the church even, right? So we have our own devotion, but there's also the church holistically. And the body of Christ is a beautiful thing in part because it is so diverse, Right. And it's diverse in all sorts of ways. 
And that diversity brings a kind of beauty to the collective understanding and sharpening that the church is able to bring both within its walls and as it moves out into the world. And so I just, I, I want people to come away thinking, I need to love God with my mind. Like Jesus was serious about that. He really meant it. And he meant it because it matters. Yeah. That's what, I mean, that's the basic, that's, that's it. Right. And it matters to my work. It matters to my relationships. It matters to all the things that I do in my life. Loving God with your mind is for the love of God in all the sort of various ways that that has meaning. Yeah. So good. Great conversation and great book. Uh, if you guys enjoyed Thanks, this, I really encourage you to go and pick up a copy. I'll have it linked in the show notes below as well as the show notes on the webpage. So go there and pick up a copy of Tim's book. It's really excellent and goes into all the questions that you're probably already thinking. Tim, uh, before we go, just do you want to point people to how they can um, follow your work, get connected with you and so on? Hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not that active on the web, but uh, people are always welcome to email me. And just so you know, uh, Tim Pickavance, an anagram of Tim Pickavance is pancake victim. So nobody knows how to spell Pickavance, but people do know how to spell pancake and victim. So if you want to find me, my simple little website is pancakevictim.com. You can find me on Twitter at pancake victim. Like I, I'm not super active in those spaces, but you'll be able to get in touch with me. So, you know, feel free to reach out. I, I love getting email from people uh, who are interested in these kinds of things. So, you know, don't be a stranger. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, all that will be linked in the show notes so you guys can uh, stay in touch with Tim and follow his work and pick up the book. Tim, just want to thank you again for spending your time on the show today. Really enjoyed it. So thanks for coming on Filter. Hey, my pleasure, Aaron. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening. I hope this episode provided you with biblical clarity to live with confidence in our confusing world. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, Please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. To catch up the latest from me, you can go to my website, AaronChamp.com. While you're there, subscribe to my newsletter so that you can be updated anytime I share new content. You can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Aaron M. Champ. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time. Until then, hold fast. <laughs>